Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gamer Reviews. And this is a series that is dedicated to reviewing different materials, rule sets, products, as well as games for miniatures wargaming. In this episode, we are going to review Warhammer Army Project's 9th edition rules for Warhammer Fantasy Battles. So, as you guys are fully aware, we're very into playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle on this channel. In fact, this channel was originally created in order to play Warhammer Fantasy 8th Edition Battles and to create battle reports with that content, and at the same time show you guys how to save money with the Wargaming Hobby with our series Hobby Side and Cheap Shots. Well, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, Games Workshop decided to uh, destroy the old world and to move away from the Warhammer Fantasy Battle setting, and they decided to pursue with Warhammer Age of Sigmar. And of course, that left a lot of old-time wargamers really upset about that because of the love that was surrounding the game of Warhammer set within the old world. The old world had 30 plus years worth of content, backstory, lore, rules, gaming tradition, different armies associated with it, and they actually developed quite a fan base over the decades that that system was in play. And when the Warhammer Fantasy battle system was basically killed off by Games Workshop, a lot of players decided to look for different alternative rule sets that they could use in order to continue playing that game. We saw the rise of Kings of War by Mantic Games. We also saw the beginnings of the Ninth Age, which is an independent movement in order to create those games as well. However, as much as those gaming systems were unique and you know kind of filled the gap, they just weren't set, you know, they just weren't Warhammer is basically what it was. So a lot of people either had to either choose to move on to Warhammer Age of Sigmar or they decided to play 8th edition like always. However, there is a blogger site written by a man named Matthias Eliasson called the Warhammer Armies Project. And uh, Matthias Eliasson is known for making army books for different factions set within the Warhammer Fantasy battle world. And these are factions that don't usually have rule books of their own. Armies like Armies from Albion, for example, from Cathay, uh, also from Dogs of War. Now what he's also done as well is he's also created a 9th edition series of rules for Warhammer Fantasy Battle and this is slowly gaining traction within the game, our gaming community. In fact, there's a lot of YouTubers on YouTube right now who are actually making um, uh, YouTube co content with these 9th edition rules. For example, Squarehammer, which is a uh, podcast as well as a wargaming channel on YouTube, has actually been featuring this content. In fact, they've kind of inspired me to make this video because I'm really interested in this new rule set and exactly to see what it looks like. And so because of that, my gaming group and I are thinking about actually making some 9th edition content based on the rules that we're seeing for the army books as well as the uh, overall rules for the game. So on this video, what we're going to do is we're going to review and talk about this quite in depth, some of the unofficial rules, uh, some of the rule changes that have been made from 9th edition for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Things we'll look at are things like the movement phase, some significant changes there, as well as the magic phase, shooting phase, as well as close combat. We'll also talk about some of the updates and changes that have been made to special rules for the uh, different armies, as well as troop types. We'll also talk about some uh, rules for weapons and armor, army composition, as well as magic items, as well as magical spells as well. So this will be a pretty in-depth dive into the uh, actual review for the rules. Now, of course, if you don't want to watch the entire video, all you're interested in are just some of the rule changes that have taken place. I will put timestamps down below in the description box where you guys can just kind of jump around and take a look at the sections that you want to. So aside from that, we're going to actually spend some time on this actual review, go through the different parts of the book, and actually talk about some of the content and some of the changes that have been made. So that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. All right, so now that we have the introduction over with, let's go ahead and talk about the deep delving of this material. So as you can see here, the PDF that this document is actually from, from the Warhammer Armies project, is beautifully done. In fact, if you didn't know any better, you could have swore this is actually official material that was created. So Matthias Eliasson has done a beautiful job with this. And as you can see, if we can zoom in real quick, as you can see, there's a lot of information that's provided inside of this uh, book. We have basic rules and characteristics. They talk about all different phases of the game as well. They also provide rules for special rules, battle uh, field terrain, all kinds of information on this one. Now, of course, we could spend hours just talking about every single rule and read it to you guys, but instead what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to focus on some very key points spread throughout the different phases of the game, especially some of the major rule changes, and I'll talk about some of the major rule changes that caught my attention, both positive and negative, and give my impressions of it as well. So we're going to kind of jump around. The first thing we're going to talk about real quick is the movement phase. It starts on page 16. Now, for the most part, let me go and just get to that page real quick. 
Now, for the most part, most of the movement phase rules are very, very similar as it has been in different editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. So there hasn't been really much that much change taking place overall in the movement phase. However, there are some key differences that are worth noting, and I'm going to talk about those real quick. On page 23, for example, they've actually made some changes to the charge range of whatever you had for your uh, armies, whenever you decide to charge. Now, originally in Warhammer Fantasy Battle 8th Edition, what you did is you took 2d6, you rolled them, of course, and of course you took your movement value characteristics, and basically that's how you basically went about charging uh, your opponent. And this one, though, however, they kind of changed it up a little bit. So instead of rolling 2d6 and adding those two scores together, what you do is you roll your 2d6 and you pick the highest score roll is what you do. So, for example, if you, like it says here, for example, if you have movement characteristic of 4, you roll a 2 and a 5 for this one, and you have a charge distance of 9 because you take the 5, add to your 4, and that's pretty much how it works. In previous editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, you took the 2d6 and add those scores together and add it to your movement phase, and that's pretty much how it works. So it is kind of an interesting change from that as well. It also kind of makes you kind of plan ahead for your charge phases as well, which is actually kind of neat as well. Now, if we go on to page 28, another major change that's also taking place as well, for me, is moving your fleeing units on this one. And the reason why that is the case is because there's changes now to your fleeing units when you suffer less than 25% uh, percent casualties. So as you can see here, it says the player takes leadership tests for fleeing units that they have. If a test is passed, the unit stops fleeing and immediately reforms. A unit that has 25% or less of its starting models left have their leadership halved instead. Which is kind of interesting because before, uh, in 8th edition, whenever you reach 25% or less of your starting unit size, what ended up happening is that you had to roll snake eyes or insane courage for those guys to rally. In this case though, instead of doing that, they take your leadership value and they have it is what they do and you round up for the characteristic. So it's actually kind of a significant change that has taken place there, which is actually kind of cool. So that's pretty much some of the major differences that have taken place within the movement phase overall. Um, for the majority of it though, most of it is pretty much similar to what you're used to seeing in Warhammer 8th edition, so there isn't really much of a change taking place there. But these are some of the main king, uh, main characteristics in, in the movement phase that I noticed where there are some significant differences. Uh, primarily with your fling units with under 25% with under casualties, as well as your charging range. So now that we've completed talking about some of the major changes that have taken place in the movement phase, another phase that's actually received a quite a bit of change has been the magic phase, especially for this ninth edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So we're going to talk about some of the differences, some of the major differences that you'll see in the changes from 9th edition, uh, from 8th edition as well. So these parts are actually kind of cool. So here we are in the magic phase. The first thing we're going to talk about real quick are spells on this one. So this one's actually kind of interesting because in the magic phase, primarily what you would do is you would basically roll uh, whatever your wizard level is worth of dice, and that would determine what kind of spells you can have. In this case, however, the spells are a little bit different this time. Instead of rolling for your spells, what you have are called levels of spells instead. Uh, they're ranked basically from level 1 all the way to level 6. And based on your wizarding level, as you can see in this little chart here, from level 1 all the way to level 4, that determines what uh, level of spells that you can actually choose from in order to make your wizard, uh, to use your wizard as well. Another thing which is also kind of interesting as well is that your signature spells are now known automatically regardless of what level you have. And every single wizard automatically knows that signature spell because it's indicative of the actual lore that they're using as well. So because of that, instead of having to choose whether you want a signature spell before and substituting it for one of your normal spells, you automatically know it, which is actually kind of cool. It gives you a much larger toolbox to you, for you to use for the magic phase, which I think is really, really neat change they actually made on that one as well. So that part was super cool. Another change that we also see as well is for the Winds of Magic in this case. Uh, specifically when it comes to your dispels as well as channeling for the most part on this one. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So first of all, we have 2d6 that you determine the strength of your Winds of Magic. And the nice thing about this is that Elias has also included how you would do larger games. So if you wanted to go with games of 4,000 points and higher, you could actually have larger pools of magic that you can actually draw from which is actually really cool as well. Now, as for the power pool and the dispel pool of dice, uh, that rule has pretty much stayed the same from 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. The difference, however, is how you go about channeling. So if it's the magic phase that's taking place in your turn phase, instead of rolling a six up to channel, you actually roll a five up in order to channel, channel uh, additional power dice, which is really cool as well. While as for the dispel pool, it's still at a uh, six up on your die roll for you to channel additional dice on that. And the reason why the, the rationale behind that is supposed to be that the controlling player's turn actually has easier access for magic since you know they're casting spells as opposed to the opponent who is dispelling in that phase. So that part's actually kind of neat in my opinion. It's kind of nice to actually see that little bit of a change there as well, which is really cool. 
Now, aside from that, another thing that we see a major change on, let me go and move on to page 37, another major thing that you also see as well is with casting bonuses. So, in the previous edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, uh, for 8th edition, whatever your wizard level was, that was what you received for your casting bonus. So, for example, level 1 wizards earn plus 1 to their casting bonus, while level 4 wizards earn plus 4 for their casting bonuses. Now, Elias Matheson, of course, has, uh, ch uh, sorry, Mathis Matthias Eliason, I apologize. He has actually changed up those casting bonuses quite differently on this one. So it says, the most common casting bonus given by a wizard itself is now equal to the wizard's level divided by half. So, a level 1 level 2 wizard gains a plus 1 bonus, whereas level 3 and level 4 wizards add a plus 2 bonus. Other casting bonuses can come from magic items, special rules, units, or terrain. Note that whatever reason, no matter the casting attempt, may have no more than a plus five casting bonus in total. So that part is actually kind of interesting how you went about doing that. It kind of it's actually kind of neat in in one sense because let's say for example, if you're playing an army that's not very magic focused, for example, it's not as detrimental to take lower level casters in your army which is actually kind of cool, and we'll talk about why that's important when we get to the army composition portion of the rules. So I thought that's actually kind of neat as well. Now, I know there's some main naysayers out there who will be really upset because, you know, they're going to miss that 4-up casting bonus for a level 4 wizard. I completely understand, but for me, though, as a player, I really don't like using magic all that often. Um, when I originally got into Warhammer, I just used to take straight-up soldiers for the most part. I mainly focused on my fighters, didn't really like using magic too much or having to rely upon it. Um, I know it was a huge factor within the 8th edition rules, but it's kind of nice seeing this change in 9th edition as well, where it's not as penalizing for you if you don't take, you know, the most amped up, tiered up magical choice within your army as well. Uh, so that part is actually kind of cool. Now the next page on page number 38, we actually start seeing some uh, individual uh, spells with ultimate power for this one, especially when it comes to miscasts. We're actually going to talk about that real quick. So when we're actually talking about ultimate power, it says for every natural 6 that you roll, when casting a spell, you automatically have a roll, an additional free power dice to boost the casting value even further. Note that any sixes rolled on these additional dice also count towards the ultimate power as well. These additional power dice are not deducted from the army's power pool, nor are they limited by wizard level. So that part's actually kind of neat. It kind of rewards you for rolling a six when you're ready on the casting value. Now the next question that usually pops up was like, well, Commander Cheapskate, what about miscasts? During the 8th edition of Fantasy Battle, if you roll two sixes, the spell automatically got cast, and because of that, uh, you also suffer from the miscast table. In this case, however, they changed it up a little bit. It says if two or more unified ones are rolled when casting a spell, it has been miscast, and the wizard has to roll in the miscast table when the spell has been resolved or dispelled. So, if seeing a gift of dispel as a miscast has occurred, always use the actual dice scores, irrespective of bonuses from special rules or magic items. If a wizard is called upon to reroll the dice for any reason, he is the second result stands as normal for the reroll. All dice rolled count towards miscasts. Regardless of whether the dice were power pool dice or granted as a bonus from ultimate power, a special rule, or magic item. So what you basically do is you take the number of dice that you rolled and then you basically uh, Oh, what you do is you roll a d6 and add them all together, and you look at the table down below. So the miscast table has a massive change to it. For example, on a roll of 2 or 3, it says the wizard cannot attempt to cast any further spells this phase. You have lost concentration, magical feedback, power drain, detonation, amnesia, cataclysmous uh, uh, calamitous detonation, demonic possession, dimensional cascade, and damned by chaos. So... There is a bunch of different new effects that are down on the Kiss Cast table, which is actually kind of cool. It kind of reminds me of the 4th and 5th edition of Magic uh, for Warhammer Fantasy Battle with the Miss Cast table. You actually had all these additional uh, things that could happen to you if you miscast, so it's actually kind of neat to actually see that. So, of course, you could also look at this if you want to go a little bit more in depth. So far, I'm really liking the changes they made to the Magic rules, so I think that's really cool. And uh, that's pretty much the major significant changes that you're seeing there. All right, so the next phase we'll be looking at now is for the shooting phase. Now, just to give you guys some clarification up front, a lot of the rules between 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy uh, battle rules for shooting the phase, same thing with the 9th edition rules, are largely the same. So we're not actually going to go through those rules all that much uh, because they relatively remain unchanged. However, there are two major fee key features I do want to bring up to your attention, though. On page 44, we can now do shooting into combat, whereas before in Warhammer Fantasy Battle 8th edition, uh, you could never shoot into combat in fear of hitting your own troops. The only people who could, of course, do this, of course, were the Skaven. They were allowed to do 
that, but they're Skaven slaves. However, now in this edition, though, uh, so long as enemies within four inches of an unengaged arc of an enemy unit, uh, you can actually open fire on them now. However, when you roll a d6 so to see if you hit anybody on a roll of one, though, you hit a friendly unit when then it's a bing. And you're only allowed to fire into combat if the target unit is at unit strength of five or more. What's well, another big thing, too? We're going to talk about that here in a little bit when we're actually getting to the troop types, but uh, yeah, unit strength is back. Uh, unit strength was actually a rule, I think, which was in six or seven. 7th edition Warrior Fantasy Battle. I forgot which uh, edition it originally popped up in, but yeah, unit strength is back now. So that's one of the things that you can do now when shooting into combat. Another thing that we also see now on page 45, we actually have what's now called firing at short range. Enemies are easy to hit as they move closer to the fire, a fire, so any shots taken at an enemy that is closer than 4 inches gains a plus 1 to hit modifier. So that part is also kind of cool as well. We actually see this little beginning of uh, some short range rules too. And uh, that pretty much makes up the major changes that you're going to see on your uh, shooting phase for Warhammer 9th edition rules. All right, the next phase we'll be looking at now is the close combat phase. And like I said before, there isn't really all that much of a major difference between the 8th edition rules and these new 9th edition rules. So because of that, there is not much of a difference. So most of the rules are pretty much the same. However, there are a few key points that really have some major differences. I'm just going to say it up straight up right now. There are no more horde rules when it comes to close combat. So before an 8th edition, so long as you had a horde formation on your units, which is a 10 wide for normal size units, and then I think a 6 wide for monstrous units, uh, so long as you had that, you could actually attack with supporting attacks all the way up to the third rank. And uh, that was kind of like part of the whole idea that you had these huge blocks of infantry fighting it out for the most part in the 8th edition of Warhammer Fantasy battle well this time though they took away the horde rules so if you're one of those kind of guys who relied upon using horde rules for your formations tacking within three ranks back um, that's not gonna help you out anymore so that's not no that's no longer a factor anymore in, in this edition when it comes to close combat now however you feel about that whether you're for that or against that, um, that's pretty much how it is. I can actually see why some people might be upset with it, especially if you have like start like horde-based armies like orcs and goblins or skaven. That was usually something they would use a lot in order to uh, out maximize their output for their combat. But at the same time, though, what this also does is this also doesn't allow you to pressure you into making huge horde formations anymore, which is actually kind of nice. In fact, you could actually spend that, you spend your your uh, your movement, of, no, sorry, your, not sorry, your unit composition, and change it up in such a way where it maximizes the frontage of fighters that you can fight forward, which is kind of nice. But at the same time, maintain that rank bonus that you need for the depth of your troops as well. So. Seeing however you like, uh, if you're into hordes and you don't like that rule change, well, unfortunately, they made that change in this unofficial rule change. But if you do like it, or if you do like the change on that, that one's up there as well. So, regardless of how you feel, I just want to let you guys know that has been uh, a change in this edition. Now, on page 57, let's go and talk about that real quick. Like I said before, unit strength is back now. So because of that, when you're calculating your combat results as well, as you're seeing here, your unit strength is also a huge factor. That's called the outnumber rule. You earn plus one combat res if you have uh, more unit strength than your enemy. As it says here, it says when a group of warriors is facing uneven odds, it is considerably more likely to lose heart. Likewise, knowing that you are outnumbered, the foe can be a great morale boost. If a unit has higher unit strength than your enemy, add plus one to the combat result. If multiple units are involved in the same combat, calculate the combined unit strength of all units involved on both sides to determine which side might get the outnumber bonus okay so that's where we're seeing that as well and like i said we'll talk about that with unit strength here a little bit when we actually get to the individual uh, troop type rules well, so we'll talk about that here in a little bit so that part's actually kind of cool now if we move on to page 59 another thing that you see now is that steadfast that rule that you have there is now based on your unit strength if a defeated unit has a higher unit strength than its enemy it takes its break test on an unmodified leadership uh, before in Warhammer Fantasy Battle 8th Edition, what determined whether you were steadfast or not were a couple of factors, like things like if you were not disrupted, if you weren't fighting in a forest for infantry units, or the most common way that most people earned steadfast for the units is if they had more ranks than you did. So because of that, it was very advantageous for you to form your troops into column formations with very narrow unit frontages, but maximum depth as possible in order to maintain steadfast for your units. Well, in this case now, whether you agree with it or disagree with it now, it's all based on unit strength, which kind of makes sense because obviously the more fighters you have in a unit, the higher the unit strength, the more or less likely you are to break. And so that's one of the major fear changes that we see there with the, with the steadfast rule as well. And then finally on page 68, let's go and move on to that one as well. 
on page 68, what ends up happening is that uh, they've kind of changed the rules a little bit for a unit destroyed. So right here on the bottom here, it says nearby friendly uh, unit, uh, friend annihilated. If a unit with a unit ten, a strength of 10 or more is destroyed for any reason, all friendly units within 6 inches must immediately test for panic. So because of that, we see that. It says this cover situation says when a unit is wiped out by missile fire, magic, close combat, pursuit, or indeed any other occurrence. Obviously, it's best to leave the annihilated unit in place until the tests are taken in order to give a point of measure from. So because of that, we do see that, which kind of makes sense because if a unit for unit 10 strength gets destroyed all of a sudden, that's a pretty significant casualty and that could cause some panic. So that's an additional rule that change that we actually see here now when it comes to uh, panic tests for the most part. So like I said before, not very many changes from the original 8th edition for close combat, but there are some important nuances to remember uh, for this unofficial 9th edition rules. All right, so now we're moving on to the special rules on this one. And so like I said before, there's a lot of different special rule changes that have been made between the 8th edition of Warhammer Fantasy and these unofficial 9th edition rules. Now for most of the rules, they're pretty much very similar to the 8th edition rules, so there aren't some major changes. But like I said before, in this video though, we'll be talking about some of the major changes that you might see. So let's go ahead and talk about those real quick. So for example, on page 71, we now have a new special rule called Animated Construct. It says, some creatures are not living beings, but constructs come to life through the use of powerful magic. Animated constructs have the immunity to poison attacks and unbreakable special rules, explained later on in this chapter. However, they may not march. So because of that, we knew we have automatic constructs. So from what I'm seeing from some of the army books out there, this would definitely impact Tomb Kings because they have a lot of animated constructs in their armies as well. This also would affect a of vampire accounts too because they also have animated constructs. So this new special rule that you're starting to see here, it's actually kind of neat to see uh, some of these new rules coming into effect as well. On page 72, another thing we also have are two new rules called Dodge as well as Expendable. So let's go ahead and talk about those real quick. So Dodge rule, some creatures are naturally quick and agile, allowing them to avoid dangers by dodging out of harm's way. Models with this rule gain a ward save against attacks in their front arc, including templates, stomps, and impact hits as indicated in the brackets. This cannot be used against magical attacks that hit automatically or have the always strike first special rule, nor can it be used if the model is subject to always strikes last special rule. Finally, dodge cannot be used by mounted models unless specified. So we start seeing this a lot. And the reason why this dodge rule is kind of important is because for some of the army book changes in ninth edition, primarily elves, uh, we start seeing this dodge rules uh, quite a bit for elvish armies. So that's why we see that as well. Another rule that we see as well is expendable. It says some units are practically considered worthless by the of the army either due to their low status or being simple beasts and no heat is paid for their demise. Models of this special rule do not cause panic to friendly units that are not expendable themselves. Characters may not join a unit with this rule unless specified. For every core unit with the expended, uh, expendable special rule in your army, you are required to include at least one other core unit without the expendable rule. For more information on this, see the Choosing Your Army chapter. So these are things like goblins, for example. They don't cause panic for orcs, things of that nature. So we start seeing that expendable rule as well. Now, a really, really big change that we see right now is in the fear special rule on page 73. So let's go and talk about that real quick. So it says fear. Some creatures are so large or disturbing that they provoke an irrational fear in the foe. Units in base contact with one or more models that have the sphere special rule suffer minus one to their combat resolution. If the unit strength of an all fear causing models and base contact is double or more, the combat resolution penalty is increased to minus two. If the majority of models in a unit cause fear, they also gain immunity from fear special rule described later on and thus ignore the combat resolution penalty. So before what you would do in Warhammer 8th edition is that you would take a leadership test and that would affect your weapon skill in this case, but that is not the case here. We actually see this now when it comes to uh, fear. So really, really big change on that one as well. So with that being said, we're also going to talk about another special rule we start seeing as well, which is Ice Attacks, which is on page 75. I'm going to pull that up real quick. So Ice Attacks. So now we have this new special rule. Ice Attacks slow down the foe and weaken them, making them easier targets. Model with Ice Attacks special rule cause all enemy units uh, in base, oh, sorry, enemy models in all base contact with them to be subject to Always Strike's last special rule. Spells or missile attacks that are Ice Attacks cause the enemy to be subject to the Always Strike last special rule until the start of your next turn if they are successfully cast or hit. Models with Ice Attacks have immunity. Ice Attacks and see immunity special rule. Unless otherwise stated, a model with this special rule has Ice Attacks for both shooting and close combat. Any spells cast by the model are unaffected. 
as are any attacks made with magic weapons that may be wielding whether they be shooting or close combat attacks. So once again, a nice little new rule change has been added to it. You can see this being used quite a bit by Ogre Kingdoms as well as those who favor using the Lore of Heavens uh, for their magic spells as well, so that part is really cool. Same thing with page 76 as well. On page 76, we start seeing, oh, where is it at? It should call lightning attacks. Here we go, lightning attacks. Lightning is especially dangerous to those wearing metal armor, being burnt to a crisp by the energies unleashed. Lightning attacks have the ignore armor say special rule against all armor types except natural armor, which they'll explain later on. We'll talk about that here in a second. Unless otherwise stated, a model with this special rule has lightning attacks for both shooting and close combat. Any spells cast by the model are unaffected as are any attacks made with magic weapons that they might be wielding whether they are shooting or close combat attacks. So because of that, it's kind of neat. We kind of see this lightning attacks really, really messes up your armor uh, uh, saves on this one as well. Now, another one we start seeing too is on page 77 as well with magic resistance. Um, once again, the magic resistance, we see this. We gain actually dispels to enemy wizards, uh, to enemy spells this time as well. We also start seeing some ward saves being attached to it as well, which is actually kind of nice. And of course, as always, whenever a character of magic resistance joins a unit, that unit also gains it as well. So that part is really nice too. Now, like we said before, we have this rule called natural armor now, which is a new one that's kind of popped up. As as many enemies or creatures have gnarled, tough, or scaly skin that offers the same protection as roped armor. The height of some creatures form a kind of natural armor that grants the model an armor save. The degree of the armor save varies from model to model and will see stay in the brackets. Natural armor save can be combined with other armor as normal, including other sources of natural armor. So we start seeing that as well. Kind of acts like scaly skin, so that way it kind of helps negate the whole lightning uh, attacks rule if you're really worried about that one as well. Also on page 78, we also start seeing some big changes for poison attack. So let's talk about that real quick. It says, there are many warriors who use deadly toxins to overcome their foes, turning an otherwise minor injury into a mortal wound. A model with poison attack special rule gets a plus one modifier to any wound rolls. For example, if they would normally need a four up to wound, a model with poison attack now only needs a three up in order to wound. Armor saves are modified by the strength of the attack as normal. Unless otherwise stated, a model with this special rule has both poison shooting and close combat attacks. Any spells cast by the model are affected as are any ma attacks made with their magic weapons they might be wielding, whether they be shooting or close combat attacks. So this time it's a little bit different. Before in Warmer 8th edition, whenever you rolled a natural six, that wound attack automatically wounded. In this case though, the poison attacks though, only give you a one up on modifier instead. So depending how you want to look at it, uh, this could be viewed as a good or a negative um, and rule change on this one, uh, depending on your particular tastes when using uh, poison attacks. But uh, there you go, that's one of the major range changes that we see as well. Now, um, we're not going to go over all the special rules just because there's so many of them there. So if you want to take a look at these more in depth, I suggest you download the PDF and take a look at yourself. All right, so now we've come to the troop types rules. So like I said before, there have been some major rules um, that have actually caused some of these units. And we're going to talk about that real quick. So first of all, for infantry. Pretty much the same thing. However, now we have the addition of unit strength now. So because that infantry models have a unit strength of one, and once again, of course, you add those up as always. We also see some changes now for monstrous infantry as well. For monstrous infantry, one of the things they actually have now is that first of all, monstrous infantry have a unit strength of three, so that's a huge rule there. And also, they automatically cause fear and they automatically have swift stride now. So that's the thing that we actually start seeing now for monsters infantry, which is actually kind of cool. And on page 84, we also see another change for cavalry. In this case, for cavalry, we do have a unit strength of two in this case. So because of, they do have that base uh, unit strength. However, another thing they also do is that cavalry now are subject to the special rule impact hits as well as swift stride. Note that impact hits are a result of the strength of the mount, not the rider. So now we have impact hits coming from cavalry, which is actually kind of a nice boost. At the same time, the unit strength rules adding add to cavalry is also really nice as well. It's kind of a nice little bonus given to that too. So that part is really cool. So if you're one of those kind of players who likes to use cavalry, uh, cavalry heavy armies, this would be a nice little addition that you can now use for your stuff. So that part is really cool as well. Now on page 85, we also have what's known as monstrous cavalry. And once again, the unit strength is here again. They have unit strength of four as well, which is actually kind of nice. And they also, not only do they also have that, but they also automatically cause fear. They also have one impact hit, just like with cavalry units. And they also have swift stride, which is actually kind of cool too. Now, moving on to monsters. We're gonna actually talk about those real quick. 
So monsters in this one, once again, we have these guys being used as unit strength. For unit strength, the unit strength is equal to their starting number of wounds. So that's what we have for unit strength. So that part's kind of neat. Also, another thing that we also see as well, they also have Stomp as well as Swift Stride as well as Terra Rules. So that part's still there. And at the same time, we also have Split Profile as well. So it says here the crew and the beasts use their own weapon skill, strength, initiative, attack characteristics when they attack. The wounds and the toughness of the crew are never used. Hits are resolved against the monster's wounds and toughness. So that part is actually kind of interesting as well. So as you can see here, we no longer have a monster reaction table on this one anymore. So uh, if your monster gets killed with the mount, if your monster gets killed, uh, your rider gets killed too as well. Now, there are some positive and negative effects with this, uh, for instance. One of the things that are some positives about this, you don't have to worry about having your mount shot out from under you anymore. Uh, so because of that, you don't have to worry about that. So that part's kind of nice. However, um, the, th the sad part about that is that the wounds are now calculated with one pool. And that's where I have an issue with it myself. That's the only thing I never liked about monster rules in this case. Um, instead of combining them together, they actually just use the monster's base uh, wounds what they end up doing, which always kind of threw me off, for example, because like here, for example, let me give you an example of why this kind of throws me off. Let's pretend you have a dragon, right? And dragons typically have a six wounds on this, right? And let's say you have a lord level character that's riding that dragon. And typically speaking, lords have usually run an average of three wounds a piece, right? So based on this rule, if we're only using the monster's rules wounds characteristic which is six it kind of bothers me a little bit because what ends up happening is that okay i understand what your rationale is so that we don't have to worry about monster reaction table and also kind of simplifies the rules a little bit but what happens to the rider does the rider automatically lose uh two wounds uh three wounds off his characteristic just because he's simply running a monster or vice versa is the dragon three wounds less because um it just happens to have a dude running on his back you know, and that's the thing I never liked about that. That's always something that's really kind of bothered me, especially when it comes to monstrous cavalry as well as monstrous uh, monsters as well. That's always kind of bothered me a little bit. Like, for example, you have Mornfane cavalry, for example, correct? Mornfane cavalry for ogres. Ogres riders usually have three wounds, and then their mounts have three wounds as well. The Mornfang also has three wounds. So when does it end up happening? Does the Mornfang lose three wounds because it has a rider on its back now? Or does the ogre lose his wounds because he's riding a monster now? You see? It kind of throws it off. Personally, I feel that you should just combine all the wounds all together. So, like, for example, if you were to do Monstrous Calvary, that's what you do. The mount and the uh, rider, you pull their wounds together, and that's what you use. Um, people would say, like, well, that's not fair because, you know, they got so many wounds. Well, you also pain that out the teeth for that unit with point values. So there's also that as well. I think they should do exactly the same with monsters if they're going to combine profiles like that as well. Just combine the rider's wounds with the monster's rule and just count all at once. Now, a lot of people out there would be like, well, Commander Cheapskate, that's OP and you can't do that. Balance, balance. Uh. Well, you're also paying a lot of points for that miniature as well. So if you really want to make that miniature worth its points value, I just say just combine the wounds together. So that's just me. That's my my personal opinion but, uh, but anyways I could go all day on that topic so we're just gonna move on real quick so that's one of the things you actually see there now is also monsters another thing which is actually kind of interesting as well is that we now have this new uh, web, uh, unit type called shrines so that part's actually kind of cool as well the unit strength of course is equal to the number of wounds on the shrine as well they also give you some special rules attached to that too which is actually kind of neat so it's kind of cool so now you start seeing this new unit type shrines popping up in this edition as well and that pretty much makes up some of the major changes that have taken place between uh, 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle as well as the 9th edition rules. All right, so now we've come down to weapons and armor. And I'm just going to tell you guys straight up, there is a huge amount of changes taking place with weapons and armor. So we're going to talk about some of those changes here in this segment of the 9th edition rules. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So now we have a new weapon for a cult pole arm now. So those are kind of like your halberds that you used to have back in the day. It still requires two hand with a plus one strength. So they, all they did for there is they just kind of changed the name for it as well. But a huge difference now is that we have great weapons now. So before, when you had great weapons, it'd give you a plus two strength bonus but you always struck last that's pretty much how it worked well in this case now it only gives you a plus one strength bonus all right and it gives you minus two initiative what it does it requires two hands and you got that strength bonus now there is a notation here that says that the great weapon does give you a two up strength bonus and the first round of close combat 
but after that, it's only one strength in the following rounds. So that part is kind of neat because for a lot of people, taking grit weapons was always a risk-benefit type of analysis, whether you could take enough damage in return before you could strike back with a higher strength. Now this is not such a big deal now because now it only gives you minus two to your initiative, which is actually cooler in my opinion as well. Same thing with flails now. We also have flails. Now we have the strength for us as a user, but they get a two of strength bonus. So that part's kind of neat. And at the same time, they don't give you that penalty after the first round. It just looks like it's always constant all the time which is really cool. Now, Spears. Spears have also got a huge update as well. So it's kind of neat for when it talks about this. Now we have some bonuses that you get with plus one strength and plus one initiative, but that only applies if you are charged against by war beasts, cavalry, monsters, infantry, monsters, beasts, monsters, cavalry, chariots, as well as monsters. So it makes you guys having spears, you know, really, really important that way when they're fighting against those tougher units. And they also fight an extra rank, which has always been the case with these guys. But this time, though, the fight an extra rank bonus, though, is not necessarily um, if you get charged against. It looks like it's just all the time now, which is actually kind of cool. At the same time, we also have pikes as well. The pikes have the same exact rules for spears, where you get initiative and strength bonuses um, against certain unit types, but you also fight in three extra ranks now. So now we start seeing the emergence of pikes within units as well. And the same thing here, we also have the spears having the plus one strength bonus, as well as plus one initiative. That's only if you charge when carrying it as well. The same exact thing happens with lances. You get plus two initiative now, as well as plus two strength bonus. That only applies though if you charge into combat. And now you have two additional hand weapons on this one. You get plus one attack and a six up parry save. So that part's kind of neat too. So that's some of the changes that we start seeing there as well. Now, another thing we start seeing now is for missile weapons. As you see here now with short bows, they pretty much do the same, but now they do what's called multiple shots. And that only applies if the model has not moved. It cannot be used in a charge reaction, however. So that part's kind of interesting. They add that rule for both bows, short bows, as well as long bows as well. So that part's kind of neat. Crossbows, and it looks like handguns are pretty much still the same. We now have new blowpipe rules as well, which have poison attacks. They're quick to fire, have multiple shots. Same thing with pistol attacks. These are only give combined as a hand weapon. So that part's kind of cool too, as well as brace of pistols. So we still have those rules, which are pretty much still the same. Javelins are exactly the same thing now, except that javelins now have the armor piercing rule attached to them, which is actually kind of nice. Throwing weapons, they got multiple shots like they've always had. Same thing with throwing axes. And at the same time, slings, of course, have multiple shots applied to them as well. So that part is really cool. Now, another thing we also start seeing now is the addition of armor. So as you can see here now, armor is actually quite different now. They've actually kind of divided the statistics where you have plus one for combat and they kind of give you with the uh, against missile attacks as well and they give you addition rules there as well, which is kind of cool. But now we have what's known as medium armor is what it's called now. So that's kind of like how heavy armor used to be. So like before, you used to have light armor, which would give you a six up armor save and then you had heavy armor, which would give you a five up armor save. Now we don't have that anymore. We have light armor, which gives you six up armor save as always. Medium armor now, which gives you a five up armor save. And now we have heavy armor, which gives you a four up armor save. So that part is really cool as well. We do now have the inclusion of full plate armor, which gives you that uh, armor save of three up as well. So that part is kind of neat. So that part is kind of cool. We're starting to see that being added there as well. And of course, we have our shields, which of course only applies when you use a hand weapon for parrying. And of course, uh, infantry armor shields get additional plus one to their armor save against missile attacks to their front. So it's kind of neat. So that it looks like they have like that whole shield wall phalanx type of rule system assigned there. We also are seeing the brand new use of a buckler, which gives you uh, parry rules and a save in close combat, but not against missile weapons. We also have your barding rules as well, which is actually kind of cool. So that part is neat. Like I said before, lots of changes for the weapons and armor, which I find to be very, very fascinating and very interesting for this edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. All right, so the very last thing we're gonna talk about real quick is army composition, because there has been some changes with the ninth edition rules when it comes to your army composition. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick with your army list. So as always, you still have the 25% minimum core requirements. That part hasn't changed how as well. Same thing with war rare, you have 25% of your army composition go for your rare choices. But the biggest change, however, though, has to possibly be with your characters in this case now. So what you end up happening in this case now for Lords and Heroes is you're basically going to spend up to 25% for Lords and 35% up to Heroes or a combination of both. That can only be up to 35% overall for both categories is what it ends up being for your army, uh, for your army list as well. So a lot of people, whether you like these rules or not, it's kind of up to you. In the original 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle, you can only do 25% Lords and 25% Heroes. Um, with the end time rules, that bumped up to 50% overall. So, and I kind of like that system a little bit more because 
It was something I was used to seeing in Warhammer Fantasy Battle back when I used to play 4th edition during the Hero Hammer phase, so that part is kind of neat. So, you know, it, depending on your viewpoint on that, whether you like 35%, 25%, or whatever the case may be, that's just down to your personal thing. However, one of the things I don't care for, however, is this, minim is this uh, what you call it, is for the uh, duplications. Let me go and show this real quick. We do have duplication, duplicate choices on this one. Now, this part I kind of don't like too much just because I feel like so long as you have the points and you're not breaking the percentages, um, I don't like that idea about the duplication points. But, you know, that's just me, for example. So, for example, if you play at 3,000 points, you can take up to three duplicate special point joints to choices, which is, you know, makes kind of sense. Between the 2,000, 2,999 range, you can take twice as many du uh, special choices in terms of duplicates. So, that part, that's yeah, kind of reasonably understand. I get that. What I don't like, though, is the rare choices. I don't care for that too much. Um, for example, you got, you know, you can't do duplicates all the way up to 3,000 points. You can only duplicate a unit once. Um, that part I'm not too keen on. I don't care for that too much, but that's just me personally. Uh, but for some people, though, I can understand why you might like that. I just feel like that's just limiting your army choices too much, in my opinion. Just because, like, when people say, like, ooh, balance, I just kind of laugh whenever someone tries to use that as a counter-argument for anything. And the reason why I feel that way is because in warfare, especially in real life, there's no such thing as balance in warfare. Um, you have strengths, you have weaknesses. Your opponent has strengths, you have weaknesses. The idea is that you want to optimize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses while at the same time minimize your opponent's strength and maximize your opponent's weaknesses when fighting them in real life. So, but that's just me though, because that's just my personal viewpoints on stuff. So there you guys have it. Those are the different changes you see now for army composition. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and there you have it. This is my review of Matthias Eliasson's 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle uh, battle Rules that he's made for the 9th edition. And uh, so far, I think this is actually an extremely well thought out, well written, and an excellent piece of work that Matthias Eliasson has put together. And considering that he's doing this all for free, not being paid, that's just absolutely amazing to me as well. And same thing with his army books. If you guys haven't got a chance yet, you should really go down to the Warhammer Armies project and check out the material he's created the codexes and the army books he's made for the different factions for both 8th edition as well as 9th edition are beautifully done they're extremely professional in fact if you didn't know any better you could have swore that these were actually official documents that's how good they really are and this is my overall review of the 9th edition rules for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now, like we said before, these are unofficial rules, so whether you like or dislike these editions or plan on using them in the future, that is entirely up to you for your personal preferences. But just wanted to let you know that's a resource out there if you're looking for a way to play Warhammer Fantasy Battle with an updated rule set. Especially since he's also created 9th edition rules for every single army book uh, for the, for the, that he actually creates for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Games Workshop could take a cue from this guy and realize that maybe you should write all your rules out first and then roll out an edition. You know, just saying Games Workshop. This is a guy who's doing this on his free time and he's showing you guys up. But that's just my personal opinion. In my opinion, this is a very excellent resource. And in fact, my gaming group and I, we are actually planning on using this in some future battle reports later on down the line when we get around to uh, doing that. So we're really looking forward to that development as well. So that's good to do for this one, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest wargaming news related to this channel. That's good to do for this one, you guys. I'll catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.